Thank you. It's a, a great pleasure and a great honor to be, to be invited to give a talk here. Actually, I, I'm impressed that you are inviting uh, outsiders like, like me, like a physicist in this audience. And uh, I think probably for m most people in computer science, it's clear that physics has something to do with computer science because it's, it builds up all these machines that can then be used. But uh, uh, also here I want to convince you that physics maybe can provide an interesting framework for, for reasoning about fundamental problems in the theory of computation. And uh, I, I need to say a few words about my, my title. It has two parts. One is affirmative. It says that more is different. And the other one is a question mark. And uh, I, my aim is to try to convince you that the, the answer to the, to the question is yes. Uh, more is different is actually a sentence which is, uh, which is a title of a, of a paper by Phil Anderson, a famous Nobel Prize winner and uh, one of the most influential uh, uh, researchers in condensed matter physics. He wrote a paper in Science in 1972. That was the title of the paper. And uh, it was a, a paper about reductionism. Uh, reductionism. Actually, it was, a, it was part of a dispute between condensed matter physicists and, and particle physicists and nuclear physicists about what is the most important part of physics and science. And uh, I will not try to, to, to completely summarize the, the paper of, of Phil, but uh, basically he was, of course, arguing in favor of reductionism, but uh, he, he was also arguing in, in the fact that reductionism does not mean, does not imply a hierarchy of sciences. It, it does, and the reason for that is that it does not imply the possibility to reconstruct. That is, if you have a theory which explains you the collective behavior of a lot of elements, of course, it has to be disentangled, and you have to, to look at each element, each special ingredient. And the, the global theory has to be consistent with the, with the behavior of each element. But it's not, the, the mere knowledge of the behavior of each element does not imply that you are able to, to reconstruct the whole thing. And, uh, and so he puts here a, a kind of hierarchy of science, but not a hierarchy in the sense of, of one which is more fundamental than the other, because basically the idea is that at each level, at each scale, it's a hierarchy of scale. So you see, you start with elementary particle physics, you go to, to solid state physics or many body physics, many body, you go to chemistry, chemistry, you go to molecular biology and so on. Uh, there is no computer science here for some, uh, for some reason, but you understand why. But uh, uh, the, the idea is that each item of the left column has to be compatible with the scale which is below it. But it also generates its own concepts, methods, and, and, and results. And uh, let, me, uh, let me show you a couple of examples of what he had in mind. Uh, basically, at the turn of the, of the, of the beginning of the, of the 20th century, you could think that everything was known in, in physics. You had Newton law, or uh, a few years later, you get Schrodinger equation. But still, you have this fascinating uh, problem, which is that you take such a simple problem as water and uh, uh, H2O, and you take these molecules, and you understand pretty well how they interact. And why the hell comes that all of a sudden, at a certain temperature here, it can be in two possible phases, two possible states, which are so different from one from the other, which is a, a, a liquid or a solid. So, the, uh, this, this has been known, the mechanism has been well understood since Onsager in 1944. So Onsager uh, was, was addressing the, the issue in terms of magnets, not in terms so much of, of molecules of water. So you look at a, at a, at a magnet, you, you look at the microscopic behavior, it has a lot of, uh, of, uh, of spins of ma in elementary magnetic moment, they interact. And then you, you, you look at the interaction between these, these, these spins, it turns out that the energy is, is, is lower when the spins are parallel than when they are anti-parallel. And when you put that into Boltzmann's law, you, have, you favor. It means that this configuration is more probable than the other one. The thing that Onsager did, and which was not at all obvious, was to realize that because of this, at some very specific temperature, all of a sudden, this measure, the, the, the interaction between the spins don't change with temperature, but you, you just change this parameter at a certain critical temperature, there is a phase transition. The phase transition goes into a collective state, and the collective state has the following properties. 
First of all, most of the spins tend to align, so that you generate a spontaneous magnetization in one direction. But at a given moment, if you take a, a snapshot, not all the spins are aligned. There is a fraction of them which are in the wrong direction. And then you take another, sn another snapshot, and then other spins are in the wrong direction. But you always have the same fraction which point up. So it means that this phase, the phase which I call spins up, is a collective state. And it is very robust. You could, you could now you can introduce impurities in that sample. You can, you can have some spins which are missing. You can have some interactions which are wrong, and so on. If, the, if it is a small amount of disorder, you will have a stability of this magnet, and you can still orient yourself with this magnet. So this is a collective state. There is a phase transition at a very well-defined temperature, 1043 Kelvin for iron. And that happens only in the large end thermodynamic limit. So that's always that's the thing which is very important. You need to have a large sample. So this is where more is important and where more is different. This is a phenomenon of large size system. Actually, large size does not, here in this case, it's 10 to the 23, but it does not mean that it has to be so. Uh, you use exactly the same thing in, in, uh, in your magnetic disks, for instance, with domains which have size of tens of nanometers. So it's large N does not, large N can be a, a million. And then there is spontaneous breaking of the symmetry. So you have actually two of these states. One of these states has majority of spins pointing up. The other has majority of spins pointing down. So if, for instance, you, you go here, you go to three quarters of the, this is a critical temperature, and you have one state where you have 80% of the spin which point up, the other one which has 80% of the spin which point down. Not always the same spins, and they fluctuate in time. So this is, this is interesting. It's, it's a very robust state of matter. With, uh, nothing to do with, well, you can use it for computation if you build some very small magnetic domain. So you can store information in that. But that's not a big deal. The thing that really was a breakthrough in this, in this sense, for, in my opinion, is the uh, appearance of a uh, uh, discovery in the middle of the 70s of systems which have, of spin systems, which have uh, uh, many, many states. And uh, these, are sp these are called spin glasses, like uh, uh, impurities of manganese in copper. And it turns out that in this case, the energy between two spins can be either uh, uh, ferromagnetic, that is it, is, it favors the spins pointing parallel, or anti-ferromagnetic. It means that, uh, and that depends on the, on the distance between the two spins. So you have uh, this energy function which characterizes the two spin, the sigma i point up or down, sigma i is plus one or minus one, and you have this energy, you put that in the Boltzmann weight, and you ask the same question. Is there a phase transition? Well, what is new with respect to what we had before? The first thing is that it's a disordered system. So each spin sees a different local field. It's not homogeneous. At low temperature, you have frustration. It means that you can have, for instance, triplets of spins which have all antiferromagnetic interaction. You cannot satisfy all the, all the constraints. So it means that spins f tend to freeze in random direction. It's also very difficult to find the minimum of the energy. And actually, uh, it's a, a very well-known NP-hard problem. So this problem of spin glasses and this very simple problem here, you see you have a, basically you have sigma i takes value plus or minus one, you have coupling j i j which are taken from a random Gaussian distribution. You ask the, the proper, what is the property of this measure? Does it have a phase transition at a finite temperature? Very simple, I can describe the problem to you in a, in a few words. It's totally useless. It has generated tens of thousands of papers no grant. Actually, all the people who have been working on that have been working, uh, have, have gotten their grants from other sources, but were working on that as a, as a passion. And, uh, and it has generated a, a, lot of, uh, a lot of ideas, and I like it. Just to give you uh, one example of, of the strange experimental behavior, because these are experimental systems, they exist. This is a measure of the magnetic relaxation. So you put a spin glass, you put it in a magnetic field, you measure the magnetization. Magnetic field tends to align the spins. Magnetization de decays as a function of time. Here is after 400 minutes. So you have to be very patient because you see the system is relaxing on an extremely long time scale. It's a very slow system. That's why it's called a glass. A glass, a glass is a system that relaxes extremely slowly. And then this was relaxing at 12 Kelvin. You change the temperature, 10 Kelvin. It starts to, to it, it's, it feels a change of temperature. So all of a sudden, the, the, the magnetization jumps up, and then it starts to relax again. After 800 minutes, you put it back at 12 Kelvin. And what happens is that it starts again and, and, and relaxes very slowly. 
Now here in the, in the top curve, what you have done, what they have done is you take off the intermediate uh, moment between 400 and 800 meters, the one which was at 10 Kelvin, and you glue the two pieces. And the two pieces, when they are glued, they go exactly on the relaxation that you would have found if you had not changed the temperature here. So you have a system which has extremely slow relaxation, memory of what it was doing, and a new dynamics that appears in the middle. This, we have some idea of what, why it is so. Uh, we have, a, th there is a, an idea which is related to the existence of many metastable states with a hierarchical, uh, an ultrametric structure actually, and which could explain this kind of experiment. But that's not the aim of my talk. It was just a slide to show you that there are real experiments on spin glasses also. I want to t tell you of one model. I, 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 will, I will have a, a just uh, three or four slides on this, on this model of spin glass so that you understand what is the model that, that people have been working on. It's a model with what we call three spin interaction. So you have, again, the easing spins, SI, which are binary variable, plus one or minus one. They interact with, with triplet interaction. And the triplet can be either, we call it a plaquette interaction. So if JIJK is plus one, it favors the configuration where the spins are all parallel or one pointing up and two down. If JIJK is minus one, it favors this, these kind of, of configurations. Now, imagine that you, you take a system of spins and, and you generate randomly triplets and you, uh, you create this energy function and you look at the, at the Boltzmann weight and you do a Monte Carlo simulation. So you try to generate equilibrium configuration for this measure. So uh, this, for instance, is a case where the simulation I show you, you generate 10 to take 100,000 spins, four triangles per spin randomly chosen. So you have a kind of random hypograph of interaction between the spins. Now you cool the system down, you find this, this is the energy density, and uh, this, is, this, this is what you find when you 10 to the four Monte Carlo steps per spin, 10 to the five, 10 to the six, 10 to the seven, and you stop here. And then you can show that in this system, if your, your, your computer time it does not grow exponentially with the size of the system, you will reach here inherently a, a limit in the, the kind of energy that you can get. At zero temperature, you should get the ground state energy, and the ground state energy, the true ground state of the system is here. So this is exactly what is a, a, a glass phase. It has a dynamical phase transition, which is here. And uh, basically, it tells you that by doing this, this cooling, you cannot go better than this energy here. And it has an equilibrium phase transition, which is here, which is called Kautzmann transition. So this is a theoretical construction for the theory of glasses. Now, all this has created a, a, an enormous amount of work. As I told you, uh, tens of thousands of papers. Just a few benchmark. Technically, uh, the, there was a big uh, boom in the, in the field at the end of the 70s with the, with the introduction of the theory of, of, of replica theory in this system and replica symmetry breaking. In the 80s, it was understood that the system has many pure states and ultrametricity. And then there was a the development of the, what is called the cavity method that is uh, something which, is, uh, which will have some influence for the, I will discuss it for the rest of the talk. Phil Anderson, again, uh, described in a series of, of papers of, of spin glasses, he describes it as a cornucopia. And cornucopia, because it has had influence in, in, very, different, uh, in very different fields. As early as the, as the early 80s, there was uh, uh, papers inspired by spin glass uh, ideas about matching traveling salesman problem, then neural network, satisfiability, error correcting codes, and com compressed sensing. So why? Why is it so? Well, intrinsically, spin glass theory deals with the collective behavior, so that's the more is different, and the emergent properties of system made from many different atoms. Okay, that's the field of statistical physics for strongly disordered systems. So the atoms can be very different things. It can be magnetic moments in spin glasses, molecules in structural glasses, information bits, neurons, spikes, that's when you look at the information processing in the brain logical variables in constraint satisfaction, agents on a market, etc. So that's kind of, of, a, of a global framework, let's say, for analysis. Now, this is interesting. At the same time, it's very risky 
because uh, when you enter this kind of field, there is always this risk that you, you, you have some soft, soft talk about extremely universal mechanism, that everything is the same in all these the various fields, and, uh, uh, but that, that typically has absolutely no impact on science. Now, there is, that's the risk, so we have to be conscious of the risk. Now, there is a remote goal, and the remote goal, in my opinion, is the following. We have in spin glass, we have the same kind of phases as we have in, in a ferromagnet. That is, we have a kind of collective phase, which is extremely robust. But instead of having only two states, majority of spins pointing up or majority of spins pointing down, we have many, many states. Actually, in some cases, an exponential number of states. And, in, and I think that the, the, the remote goal will be to try to understand how to use these many states for having robust computing. And now, apart from this remote goal, there are some intermediate steps. And the intermediate steps uh, are, it's, it's like, you know, you want to climb this mountain, and the top of the mountain is this remote goal, and then on the way towards the mountain, you, you, you find some, some hints of, of interesting things. And, and the intermediate steps are, are to use spin glass concepts and methods to provide a different viewpoint about computation and to design new algorithms. And that's really, I will focus today on the intermediate steps because I don't have much to say about the remote goal, but I will come back to the goal uh, later on. So what are the concepts? A few, I have already given you a few list of the concepts, phase, phase transition, states, glassy phase, relaxation time, and the methods. The methods are basically mean field approach, replica method, cavity method. Today I will talk more about the concepts and I will skip all the, all the techniques. But the techniques are crucial because if you don't have the techniques, you are not able to, to apply this, uh, this concept. So th what I want to, to spend some time on is to, uh, to show you that really this notion of, of more is different and this notion of, of the importance of phase transition is actually very important in, in several, branch of several branches of computing. And, um, I will illustrate it with three examples, uh, error correcting codes, satisfiability of Boolean formulas, and compressed sensing. So let me mention a few, a few things about error correcting codes, some very standard and very well-known uh, results. So you want to send messages of length n with binary alphabet over a noisy channel. And messages, you take them from a code book, and the code book has size 2 to the L. So you look at the hypercube, it has 2 to the N, the unit hypercube in N dimension, it has 2 to the N points. You select 2 to the L of them. You have the rate of the communication, which is L over N. And then let me study this in the thermodynamic limit. Thermodynamic limit is L and N goes to infinity with fixed rate. So Look at, uh, you read uh, Shannon, for instance, and, uh, and, and you realize this, uh, the, the following result. Actually, by studying, the simplest way is to study a, an ensemble of codes. So you study a random code ensemble. The random code ensemble is very easy. You take this hypercube and you generate the code words, the code book, just randomly. And you look at what is the performance of this code. And you find the probability of error, of error versus the noise level, and the probability of error Sorry, it should be, okay, this should be zero and this should be one. You have to flip the, the you have, okay. Probability of success. This is a probability of success. Probability of success versus noise level. If success is, is in the large end limit, in the thermodynamic limit. You have probability of success, which, which has a phase transition at a very well-defined noise level, and that's the Shannon threshold. Okay, it turns out that it is the optimal thing that you can do. Now, I want to insist on two things. The thermodynamic limit, this is a result in the thermodynamic limit, and then it's a property. What is this property that you are looking at? It's a property of a generic code drawn from an ensemble of codes. Okay? That's extremely typical of what we do in statistical physics all the time. And in that sense, I will be uh, completely, my talk will be totally orthogonal to the one of the, of the previous speaker. That is, I am not looking at adversary situation. I'm looking at typical situation. Is, uh, I'm not looking at the, at the extremely rare code, very bad code that you could generate from a random code ensemble, but I'm looking at the typical one. Now, this was one example of phase transition. Now, imagine that, okay, as we know, random code ensemble does not allow you to 
really decode efficiently because it's uh, uh, exponential time decoding. So you, you start to build a, a structured code ensemble, like, for instance, low density parity check code. And you, do, uh, you imagine that you, do, you are able to do optimal decoding with that. Again, you, have, uh, uh, you don't have time constraint for decoding. And then you find that if you do that, you have a phase transition, again, at a different uh, value uh, of, the, of the noise level. And then uh, you take uh, uh, the, always your typical code ensemble, but now you, you, you introduce a, a practical algorithm, one that you are able to run in polynomial time. For instance, you, you look at message passing decoding of the LDPC code, and you find that there is another threshold here. Now, you have these various, so you have three phase transitions in this, in this problem. Two of them are just purely geometric phase transition. They are properties of the, of the, of the, of the hypercube, basically. The other one, this one, is, is a property of the algorithm. And it turns out that uh, when you look at the LDPC codes, this is due to a glass transition, a proliferation of metastable states. And so then, as, as a practitioner, what you have to do is basically to try to invent ensembles of codes that, that will be such that you push this algorithmic threshold as close as possible to the, to the Shannon threshold. And as, as we know, this, this has been done with quite some success. What is the geometrical picture for this phase transition? So this is my, my view of the, of the unit hypercube in large dimension. You have a few code words. I have not described the, others, the uh, other points of the hypercube. I put only the code words. This is a code word that has been sent. Imagine that I'm working, for instance, on a, on a binary symmetric channel, which flips some, uh, some bits randomly. So then I start from this, uh, from this point, from this code word. I receive this one because of the noise of the channel. And then if I know the properties of the channel, basically I know how many bits have been flipped because I know the noise level. And I just need to find a code word on this sphere, which is a sphere given by the level of noise. And now uh, there may happen several things. It may happen that there is a single code word and that's a favorable situation. It may happen that there are many code words on the sphere and then you are unable to retrieve. And it may happen something intermediate in which you have a single code word, but you have also a lot of metastable states. Exactly these metastable states that I was mentioning in the, in the spin glass problem. And that is exactly what happens if you look back at the phase diagram. You have this first region on the left where the algorithm is successful. It means that basically on the sphere you have a single code word that is, that is present. You have this intermediate phase in which in principle on the sphere there is a single code word, but because of the proliferation of metastable states, the message passing decoding does not converge. And that is the existence of the glass phase that fools the algorithm itself. And then, of course, if you go in this other region, you have many code words on the sphere and you are not able to retrieve at all. So this is an example of, of, uh, of the importance of phase transition in this field. You have a, a fundamental threshold which is due to a phase transition in one ensemble. And then you look at a practical ensemble. You have the fundamental transition for this ensemble. And then you have the, transition, the phase transition for the algorithm itself. Now, my second example is, is satisfiability of, of, of Boolean formulas. So uh, imagine that you, so you look at, uh, at um, uh, random case satisfiability. You take n binary variable, true or false, 0, 1. And then you put m constraints, which are clauses. And clauses involve k variables. Here it's with three variables, x1 or not x2 or x3. Now, I look at this problem in the, th again, I have a le thermodynamic limit. So you see, I have introduced an ensemble. I, I generate the clauses randomly. I have a thermodynamic limit. N and M goes to infinity with fixed ratio, M over N, number of clauses per variable. And my question is, what is the generic property of the instance dependent measure, which is the uniform measure over all the satisfiable assignments? If there is no satisfiable assignment, I could introduce, as a physicist, I would introduce a temperature. Um, it would mean that I introduce an energy, which is a number of violated clause, and a Boltzmann weight uh, related, with the, uh, related to this energy. So when you look at the thermodynamic limit of this problem, uh, initial, initial simulations, in particular by Bart Selman, Kirkpatrick, and so on, and this has been refined a lot, have observed that as a function of the size of the problem, the probability that the formula is satisfiable 
uh, function as, uh, of alpha, the number of clauses per variable, displays the following behavior. This is what you observe numerically with n equal 50. The green is with n equal 100. And the, and the, and the red is with n equal 200. OK. And so this becomes sharper and sharper. Actually, uh, the threshold conjecture says, states that uh, there should be a, 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 the probability should go to 1 in the large n limit below some threshold alpha c and should go to 0 above alpha c. It's still a, 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 a conjecture. There is a very nice result by Friedgood that shows that it goes to a step function. But the fact that the, step that the location of the step function converges in the large n limit has not been proven that I know so far. So it is because of that, it is still a, a conjecture. But OK, it is a conjecture, but it is a phase transition. Now, the thing that has, 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 has really uh, created quite a lot of interest on this problem is the fact that the phase transition, which is here, is also associated with, with a kind of of complexity will know. That is, if you look at the log of the number of, of uh, at the log of the computer time that you need in order to do these experiments, this is for n equal 50, 100, 200, you see that it grows, uh, the, the computer time grows exponentially. And actually, the most difficult instances are the ones which are in the window close to the phase transition itself. So the phase transition is really where you generate the hard instances of random satisfiability. So this, again, is a problem that, it, in some sense, it looks like, uh, like this problem of, of interacting spin glasses that I was describing at the beginning. That is, it has, uh, it has these binary variables that interact here by triplets. And, uh, and uh, the, the question is whether it's possible to satisfy all the constraints. By looking at this problem from using the, the, the techniques of, uh, of statistical physics of disordered system, uh, one comes up with, with a, a, a couple of results, which are also conjectures. The first conjecture is a location of the, of the transition point. And the location of the transition point, it should be alpha c equal 4.2667. And I could generate a list. Of, it's a solution of a complicated integral equation that one can write. But the thing which is more spectacular is the fact that right below the transition point, this is again the number of constraints per variable, right below this, this critical point, we have uh, an intermediate phase. So uh, there, is a there are two geometric transitions. This is a sat and sat transition. It separates the region, uh, the number of constraints above the threshold, the, the system is unsat, below it is sat. But when it is sat, there are two phases. And here, the idea is the following. You have, uh, uh, imagine that you color in green the states, the, 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 the points of the, of the hypercube, again, which are satisfiable configuration. And you will have, in, in, when the density of constraint is small, it turns out that the solutions are all grouped in one big cluster. So they are connected one to the other. You can go from a solution to the other one by flipping a variable at a time. And so you, can, you, you have this big connected cluster. And then at some critical value, again, another critical threshold, what happens is that this big connected cluster of solution splits into very far away, a, a large number of clusters of solution. These are the green clusters. And, and the green clusters of solution, inside each cluster of solution, you can, you can go from a solution to the other one. But if you want to move from this cluster to the other one, you need a collective move of a fraction uh, of, a, of a finite fraction of the n variables, so this is extremely uh, this is a very complicated phase. That uh, this is what I call the easy sat phase and the hard sat phase. Now I want to to, to show you exactly how it goes. So at, in terms of the energy, the number of violated clauses, basically in this phase where well, you have uh, one big uh, C connected C of solutions, and you may have some metastable states that you don't care so much about. And then here you have this intermediate phase in, where, in which you have the clusters of solution. And the, the thing which is very important is that going from here to there, you need really to flip a, 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 a finite fraction of the variables. And then you have the, the unsat phase. So this is, uh, these are the results that can be obtained by looking at this problem from the point of view of, a, of a, using the tools from uh, statistical physics. You can also compute these, uh, these thresholds. All these have the status of conjectures. 
in the sense that even the existence of the phase transition itself is still a, a conjecture. But they are supported by several, by several uh, arguments. Uh, first of all, uh, when you realize that there is this intermediate phase, uh, this intermediate phase, I should, I should insist, sorry, on one point, that uh, the, in this intermediate phase, you have an exponentially large number of clusters of solution. And inside each cluster, it also has an exponentially large number of solutions. So this is exactly what I was mentioning before about this remote goal. We have a system which has exponentially large states. And each state is very robust because each state is a collection it's in itself of an exponentially large number of solutions. Okay. So uh, w when you realize that, uh, it, uh, it allows to, to design a new algorithm which is really based on the idea of the existence of these clusters. And uh, this, uh, this algorithm, which is called survey propagation, it was a kind of, uh, I mean, our intention originally was not to build an algorithm, because I am, a, I am a theorist in statistical physics. So my intention was to understand the phase diagram and the phase transition. But then we realized that there is this intermediate phase, and that this intermediate phase having this exponentially large number of clusters of solution, uh, one has to modify in this intermediate phase. The, the, the standard belief propagation algorithm has to be turned into something which is called survey propagation. And in practice, survey propagation turns out to be an extremely powerful algorithm for this, uh, for this problem in the hard set phase. And I should also mention that there is a rigorous proof of the existence of clusters and the fact that they are well separated, at least when k is larger than 7. It's based on the existence of the, on the study of what we call x-satisfiable formula. Uh, a, a formula is x-satisfiable when it is satisfied by two assignments at distance xn. And then you look at standard upper and lower bounds using first and second moment method about the existence of x-satisfiable formulas. And you find that above the top line, there are no, you, you are sure that there are no uh, solution. The formula is not x satisfiable. x is in the abscissa. Below the bottom line, you are sure that it is x satisfiable. And so you find that there is this window in which, at, in some region, you are sure that there are some clusters. So uh, x small, you can have two points which are nearby and which satisfy the, the solution, which are two solutions. In the intermediate x region, it's not possible to have two solutions. And in the large x region, it's possible again. So it's a proof of the existence of the clusters. So this was my second example. And I want to turn into a, a third example on the, on the importance of, of phase transition. And it's some. Um, recent work that we have been doing with some colleagues on, on compressed sensing. Every child knows, literally, that, uh, uh, that uh, uh, you can compress the pictures, you can compress the, the music, and so on. And, uh, and basically, if you take one image and you take 65,000 wavelength coefficients, keep only the 25,000 largest ones, you get the image uh, pretty much correct, let's say. All interesting signals are sparse. So this has been used a lot for compression. Now, uh, the, the, the more recent trend is to try to use it at the level of data acquisition. And this is something that has, uh, that has a lot of possible uh, applications, in particular in, uh, in uh, magnetic resonance imaging, tomography, electron microscopy, astronomy, etc. And also uh, in some uh, more uh, advanced uh, uh, setting, which are nonlinear measurement like group testing and the inference of regulatory interactions among many genes using uh, gene expression data, which you can do only in limited experimental conditions. I will just tell you a few things about the simplest one, the simplest setting for, the, for this uh, compressed sensing problem, which is one of linear transforms. So you have a signal. It is an n-component signal, let's say, with uh, real components. You do some measurements on this signal. These measurements are linear measurements. And so each measurement, you do m measurements. So y1 is a certain linear combination of the signal, y2 also, and so on. So this, the set of measurements is summarized in a measurement matrix, which is a m times n matrix. Now, you do a number of measurements, m, which is smaller than the number of components, n. And your problem is to reconstruct the signal from the measurement. So in principle, you are missing data. 
The thing that is very important is that you assume that the signal is sparse, so you, are, you have gone into a correct basis where the signal is sparse. So it means that you want to exploit the fact that you know that the signal has only R non-zero components. Is this possible? Well, you will soon realize that if you generate, for instance, F uh, randomly, uh, I will discuss mostly the case in which uh, the uh, uh, elements of F, I have an ensemble in which the elements of F are independent Gaussian uh, random numbers. Uh, if you generate F randomly, you look at, at this problem and you see that it's possible to do that by enumeration. That is basically, you guess what are the non-zero element of S and then you see that you have more equation than unknowns. And so if your guess was correct, you will have a consistent set of equation. If your guess was incorrect, you will have an inconsistent set of equation. So you look at all the guesses. There are n choose r of them. And then you, you, you can do it. Of course, that's not a practical uh, algorithm. It's exponential in the, in the large n limit. So uh, I will be interested in, in looking at an ensemble with Gaussian f and in the thermodynamic limit n, m, and r going to infinity with a fixed density of the signal, the number of non-zero components per variable, and a fixed fraction of measurement with respect to the number of unknowns. So this is possible by enumeration, but, uh, but uh, not practical because the, exp the algorithm exp is exponential. It's possible, and it has been studied a lot, and that's where most of the work of uh, nearly, nearly all the work on compressed sensing deals with the L1 relaxation of the problem. In the L1 relaxation of the problem, basically what you want to do is to minimize the L1 norm of S on the subspace Y equal FS. Okay, you look at this subspace, you minimize the L1 norm. Minimizing the L1 norms tends to bring some elements to zero, and then you look at, uh, at uh, the result of this L1 norm. So this has, has given the following result, a phase diagram again. The phase diagram is written here, here in terms of rho is the density of the signal, the fraction of non-zero component. Alpha is the number of measurements per variable. So if alpha is larger than one, you know how to solve the problem because you have more equation than unknown, so that's easy. And the whole problem is to get to alpha less than one. What I told you is that uh, basically what you need is to be above this diagonal. Above this diagonal, it's possible to do it by enumeration with an exponentially slow algorithm. Below the diagonal, it's impossible. You don't have enough data. Now, the thing that uh, the, 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 phase, this, the study of this phase diagram by Dono Tanner, and then there were other works later by Kabashima and so on, the, the phase diagram shows a phase transition for the L1 reconstruction. And this is the line that is, that is written here. This phase transition separates a region where you have alpha larger than a certain critical threshold, so you have enough information to reconstruct from a region which is a blue region in which the L1 reconstruction is wrong. It is, it is wrong because by doing this L1 relaxation, you have changed the problem. You are not trying. The, the real problem should be to, to minimize the L0 norm, to find, the, to find a value of S which, which minimizes the number of non-zero components. And so uh, in some sense, so this is a measure of the success of L1. So it goes from the, the, the original method that was alpha equal 1, and it fills all this uh, green region where the L1 relaxation is OK. Now, uh, what, we, what, we, what we tried to do was to try to get into this forbidden region, let's say, and so to go beyond the uh, L1 relaxation using a probabilistic approach. So we have, a, say, a signal ensemble in which the, the signal is equal to 0 with probability 1 minus rho naught. And for its probability, rho naught is drawn from a distribution phi naught of s, which can be a, any distribution you like. And basically, we study now the reconstruction measure. And this reconstruction measure, it's a measure which is inside the subspace y equal fx. It's a measure on x. It's, it's, it has to be compatible with the measurement. And what we use is a Gauss-Bernoulli prior on x with a certain density rho. And then there is a theorem which says that if alpha is less than rho naught, that is, if you are above the diagonal in the, in the phase diagram, the most probable x is the original signal s. So if you are able to sample correctly from this measure, then you get the result. So this is a non-trivial theorem because it, it's, it's intuitive in the case where rho, rho is equal to rho naught, but uh, it's true actually even if it is not the case. 
So it tells you one thing. It tells you that for IID signals, bias reconstruction is in principle optimal, even if the prior is not the correct one. Now, in order to reconstruct from this measure, we have used uh, uh, this uh, uh, belief propagation uh, procedure. And uh, it has some very nice aspect. It is fast, it's robust to noise, and it's generalizable to nonlinear measurement. And I have no time to describe exactly how it goes. But let me show the results. This is, again, my phase diagram. Now, the, this is the phase diagram with the reconstruction threshold and the phase, the phase transition for the L1 relaxation of the problem. And now I look at, uh, at the case in which the non-zero component of the, of the signal are Gaussian. And I am using a Gaussian prior when the reconstruction. So I have a good idea of the distribution of the non-zero component of the signal. And then what we see is that there is also a phase transition for this probabilistic reconstruction using belief propagation. And this reconstruction, it has a phase transition which is here. So you, you see that I have gain with respect to L1. I have really be, now I am able to solve in this region, which was previously it was forbidden, and now it's possible. Now, if I am using still a Gaussian prior for my, for my, uh, for the, the that is, sorry, here I, I use my signal, the non-zero component of the signal are generated from binary, binary distribution, plus one or minus one. But I assume that I don't know that. And so I am using myself in the reconstruction, I do as if, the, uh, as if it was a Gaussian distribution. So I have a very bad prior. With my very bad prior, again, in some region, I can go beyond L1, but basically the gain is, is, not, is, not very, is very bad. Now, what is the reason for this phase transition? I told you that in principle, the probabilistic reconstruction is optimal if I am able to sample from this measure. And the reason is that, yes, the measure is the correct one, but again, the belief propagation algorithm is fooled by a glass phase. And here is a, an example of that. I look at rho equal 0.4. I look at the mean square error as a function of the number of iterations. The lines are computed analytically from the cavity method, and the points are the results of experiment. If I start from alpha equal 0.62, that's way above the transition, Immediate, very soon after a few tens of iteration, I go to zero error. Alpha equal 0.60, I have a, an intermediate time, but then I go to zero error. So I'm still above the transition here. And then for alpha less than 0.58, I go to an infinite plateau. This, the relaxation time of the system is infinite. So the system is extremely slow. So the, the, it's extremely sluggish. And there is no way to avoid this. Uh, there is an onset of a glass phase. The idea is the following. You have in this measure, in this measure that I'm looking at, there is a special point. And the special point is, is this original signal from which the measure was generated. And it's like a crystalline state. And you want to reach this crystalline state. It was exactly like the code word that I had in, uh, in, uh, in error, uh, error correcting codes. It's a very special point that I want to find. But then there is a multiplicity of metastable states that fools the system. But that's, from the point of view of the physicist, that's exactly the situation that you have if you have a system which has a, a crystalline state but you are not able to find the crystal. That happens very frequently, actually. Now, a lot of systems, if you, if you cool them fast, for instance, they don't crystallize. They go to a glass state. And once they are in this glass state, it, it goes there for ages. You have these glasses for the cathedrals. They have been here for centuries, and they will not, uh, they will not move, and they will not crystallize. And you know from the mathematics that the stable state of the system is the crystal. But it's no, there is no point in waiting. So how do you so how 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 do you do in such a, in such a problem? Well, actually, there is a way to get if you are able to design your measurement matrix, and I will assume that I'm allowed to do that here. Then there is a way to get around the glass trap, and it is exactly the way how do you nucleate a crystal. To build a crystal, if you want to to make a good crystal, avoiding this glass. What you do, it's not waiting. It's not by waiting longer and longer and having a bigger, compu longer computer time. It does not help. What you do is you have, to, you have to nucleate the crystalline state and then let it grow. A crystal grows. Okay? And uh, so uh, in order to do that, what you do is that you have uh, this. Um, uh, so this is just an ex illustration that I got from, uh, from YouTube, actually, about how a crystal grows. So this is. Uh, this is snow, so it's outside. This is super cool water. 
So it's water, but uh, it is below zero degree. And then at some point, uh, at some point, the experimentalist drops some piece of ice at the, at the top of the thing. And then you see that the ice, the, 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 the bottle crystallizes. So the crystal is, is growing very rapidly. Actually, because of problem of specific heat and so on, it does not fully crystallize. There is still a mixture of water because you need to have transfer of heat. It's a complicated problem in itself. But at least you have this idea that the crystallization, when you have put a certain seed of a crystal, then it can grow very fast. And that's exactly what, uh, what, uh, what you can do in this measurement matrix. And then what we will do is construct a measurement matrix which our initial measurement matrix was what we call mean field in physics. That is, it, it meant that in each measurement, you had a linear combination of all the variables. Okay. Now, what I will do is the following. I, I create a subsystem of the variables, a, a second subsystem, third subsystem, etc. Inside each subsystem, I will, I will have a mean field construction of the measurement matrix. And then I add a one-dimensional structure. And then in the first subsystem, I will put a lot of measurement. I have a large value of the number. Actually, I put alpha equal 1. I put enough measurement, as many measurements as unknown in the first system. And then in the other ones, I can have low values of the measurement. And uh, the idea is that if things go well, I will first decode the first subsystem, grow my crystal, and then the crystal will, will propagate. And that's exactly what will uh, happen. Here is the variance of the uh, matrix. So all my um, the, the elements of the random matrix of measurements are Gaussian random variables. And this is the value of the variance. So you see on the block of which are on the diagonal, I have variance which is equal to 1, j1 below diagonal, j2 above diagonal. And the first block is larger. Third block is larger because I have to put many measurements on the first group of variables so that when I decode these variables, uh, they will propagate the information in a one-dimensional way. And that's exactly what, uh, what happens in practice. And that's what we call CD belief propagation. And when we do that, uh, we find that we can, uh, we can decode. That's experimental re numerical result. We can decode pretty well uh, going uh, very close to the diagonal. E also in the case in which the prior that we use is not the correct one. So it means that uh, there is a way, at least if you have uh, enough uh, power to design your measurement, there is a way to really get around this glass trap. And actually, I should mention that this is also something that has been used in, in error correcting codes for the, exactly the same reason, that it's the same problem that you have, that you have a glass phase that you have to, to get around. Except that people who were doing that in error correcting codes, they did not use this uh, reasoning in terms of crystals and glass and so on. But the, 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 the result is the same. So this is a case in which, so that's a phase diagram. I, uh, analytically, we can show that in the large end, in the thermodynamic limit, we can decode down to the diagonal. So we can solve the problem fully. That was for IID signals. Actually, it also works in the case where the signals are not IID. This is a phantom, and uh, when you uh, do a, a first step of hard transform on your, on your phantom, you have a, a, a lot of zero elements, so it has a density 0.15. That's the L1 decoding on the first row, and you see that L1 stops to be correct around point, uh, between 0.5 and 0.4. That's the standard BP decoding without seeding, and it stops, it stops to be correct at 0.3. And that's the seeded BP, and the seeded BP goes all the way. It gives you back the phantom correctly all the way to the, to the density. That's, so it shows that uh, this algorithm that has been invented and designed for IID signal, here the signal is not at all IID. It's, the, it's what it is. It's the hard transform of this, of this phantom. So um, just one, uh, yes. So I have, I have just to one word about methods. I, I have said that they have no time to discuss uh, methods here. I wanted to show you the importance of phase transition. Uh, I should insist on the fact that all these methods that we use, mean field approach, replica, cavity, cavity is, is, is strongly related to the, to, the, to the belief propagation approach. Basically, the, the full control on this method is, is in some specific situations, not in, uh, not in all cases. But you have locally tree-like interaction or long-range interaction in which really the mean field can be, can be controlled in, all, uh, in, uh, in full generality. Let me, sorry, just... Uh, I have one more thing that I have to say. Yes. 
Yes, I, I just want in the, in the last two minutes to go back to, to, the, to this idea of the future of computing. In some sense, what I see in all this uh, approach are kind of building blocks of something that could be useful for the future of computing. And again, I want to insist on this possibility that is illustrated here on KSAT, but that we have seen, we have witnessed it in other systems as well, which is uh, the existence of this intermediate glass phase. Here it's an intermediate glass phase which has a very, uh, a very uh, clear meaning. I, again, I, I, I remind you, you have vertices of the hypercube. Some of them are, satisfy the Boolean formula that you had, and others not. I color in, in green the one that is satisfied. And I find that in some intermediate v window between 4, point, uh, between 4 and 4.3, basically, you have an intermediate phase in which the set of solutions cluster. And the clusters, they are exponentially many clusters. They are very well separated one from the other. It's inside each cluster, there is an exponential number of solutions. This is something which I find extremely, a priori, something very useful. It's like having a magnet, you know, it's, uh, but instead of having my magnet which points up or down, it can point in exponentially many different directions. But it has the same robustness. It means that if I, if I just change, you know, I put a little bit of disorder and so on, I will have the same, the same, the same robustness. And so uh, that is something that should be it, it should be possible to use it. It's an extremely robust structure. It's found in many systems. Now the questions for the, for the future is how to control, how to design, how to address these states. Can you use them? We have a, a, already a few hints that maybe something is possible. In particular, when we want to solve the, the problem of, of KSAT in this intermediate phase, if, you, if we use uh, message passing and reinforcement, we have a way to locate some of these, of these uh, clusters of solution without any a priori knowledge. So it seems that there is a way to address them, but we have still not found a, a way to use it for, for computing. So this was a, a, a couple of, of, of last comments. The states, they exist only in large size systems, so it's really a property of, of large scale computing. So it's not something that is universal and so on. It's not the, building a small device. It's really for a large size problem. All this is based on the analysis of ensembles of problems and typical behavior of an ensemble of problems. And there I want to quote some, uh, some discussion that I had with, with some colleagues, computer scientists, around the dinner a few years ago. And uh, they had learned about what we do in physics. And they told me, well, but you, in, in physics, you always think that you, nature is benevolent. There, there, is no, you know, there is no adversary in your, in your field. And uh, actually, that's probably true. That is, uh, again, all the properties, everything that I tell you is a typical property, is a property of a typical sample. When I tell you a spin glass is, is like this or like that, I, I have in mind the following. I put impurities of manganese in copper. And then I say, there will be a spin glass transition at 12 Kelvin, OK? But now, it might happen that, for, by case, it might happen that this impurity of, of manganese, they all are at such distance one from each other that actually my system is not a spin glass, it's a ferromagnet. And then the transition is not at 12 Kelvin, but it will be at uh, hundreds of Kelvin. It's completely different. Except that this is exponentially rare, because it, it's something that should have been designed. If you do it randomly, you never find it. So for me, nature is benevolent in the sense that, yes, uh, things that happen exponentially rarely, like, I don't know, having no air in this, uh, no molecule of air in, the, in, in this pot here, I don't care about it. It, it never happens. Of course, if I have an, an adversary that is able to pump the air just in front of my mouth, I, it could be risky, but I, I'm not trained in thinking in this term. That's why nature is benevolent. Um, I have not talked about techniques, but techniques are, are very interesting in themselves. And again, I, ins I, I insist that techniques are crucial because none of these bricks that I'm trying to show could have been developed without, without the, the techniques. And uh, 
replica cavity are really uh, extremely useful tools. They translate uh, from the point of view of algorithm into message passing strategies. Message passing in, in itself is, is again an interesting brick because I think that it is intrinsically very robust. You know, If I look at a survey propagation algorithm for case hat, I have my messages that I exchange and so on. In the end, I find a, a satisfiable assignment where in a region where no other algorithm is able to do it. I can, I can put noise on these messages, but it does not harm. OK, I will get a, li a little less performance, but still it will converge to the same thing. So it's, it's something, it's a, it's a robust type of computation. And also, I have in mind the following thing, that this message passing approach, it's also uh, related to, to exchange of information when you, when you have a, uh, spikes, uh, uh, spike propagating along a neuron, uh, liberating neurotransmitters, going to another spike. That's a kind of message transmission. And so knowing that you are able to do extremely difficult computation robustly using this kind of paradigm, I find that it is uh, some opening for, for the future of computing. I hope I have convinced you that, uh, that more is actually uh, different also in computing. And uh, here are a few couple of references. And I should uh, acknowledge some of my collaborators on these topics. Mm, and uh, in particular, special thanks to Giorgio Parisi, with whom we developed the cavity method, Ricardo Zecchina, with whom we did the, the case satisfiability, and Krzakalans de Borova, with whom we did the recent work on compressed sensing. Thank you very much. I convert it into physics language, I, it would mean uh, about what is the energy of the, the, what I call ground state energy. It is what is the smallest number of violated clause. And so he, here, no, you will have uh, something which is continuous from this point of view. I mean, the, the, the phase transition exists only if you ask the question, is there zero, is there a solution with zero energy, with zero violated clause or not? If you are in the in the unsat region and you ask what is the energy, this one has no has no transition. But but from the point of view, but, but there is still a clustered phase from this point of view. That is, in the region which is unsat, you still have some some uh, region of parameters in which the the things which are not solutions, but the configurations which satisfy the largest number of clauses group into distinct cluster which are far away from each other. They are not at zero energy, they are at some finite energy, but they still have this clustering property. And this impacts on the dynamics of algorithm when you want to find them. And this has been well studied. Do you know what this curve looks like? We know what this curve looks like. I, we have not, I mean, the, the problem with that is that uh, you don't have a signature. That is, I can give you some prediction, but I cannot prove the, that my prediction is correct. I mean, when I say I have a prediction that uh, in this region below 4.26 something, it is sat, and then I, I prove it and I exhibit the fact. But if I tell you I think that uh, in this va for this value of alpha, for alpha equal 4.4, the smallest number of uh, violated clause is equal to 0.3%, or I don't know, I invent a number. I can, I can have a prediction like that, but it's a conjecture that I have no way of proving to you. Uh, proving, I mean, um, documenting. Yeah. Yeah. So the attempts to use string last models in neural nets didn't go so well because of the symmetric interactions. Is there a way to loosen that and still get some of the results, or is there a move? Yes, I think that, uh, yes, there is quite some, um, actually there are some recent moves which I, I find very interesting, which is uh, uh, going to 
Okay, when, when you want exactly what you, what you say, when you want to go to, to neural networks, the thing that, that you have is more a dynamical process rather than an equilibrium measure. That's the thing which is more natural. And it turns out that uh, there is uh, some, uh, some work in the last two or three years which starts to, uh, to study the problem of uh, spatio-temporal spin glass in some sense, in which the, 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 the basic object is not the value of a spin or value of a neuron or a spike, but it's, it's time trajectory. So it's a more complicated object. But then you can start to develop the same kind of ideas, but working with time trajectories of the system. Uh, it has been studied actually in two contexts. One is a study of dynamical system with the remote goal of trying to, to develop a, a better theory of, uh, of neural network from this point of view. The other one is, uh, is for quantum spin glasses because uh, if you look at a quantum spin glass, you have exactly this, you can use Feynman's uh, representation and it develops into a time trajectory of a spin and it's exactly the same thing. So in recent years, there have been a few papers dealing with uh, um, uh, belief propagation and so on for, for space-time trajectories of the, of the speeds. And I think this is something very interesting. Of course, uh, it's, it's much more, the there is an intrinsic complexity by the fact that you are the, the, the intrinsic variable is much more complex. Then it will depend very much, I think the possibility of success in this approach will depend very much on is it possible to have a, 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 a short description of the trajectory in time of the, of the neural? That is, if, if it is an extremely complex trajectory, you cannot parameterize it on a small, relatively small number of parameters, then it will be very hard to progress. We in this. One of the talks It probably has its own. Yes, the question is whether survey propagation algorithm is able to solve the random satisfiability problem up to the threshold, to the sat and sat threshold. And the, the answer is I don't exactly know. I don't have a. But, but uh, numerically, it seems that it stops before, slightly before. And um, it's, OK, it's, it's complicated. It's, it's difficult to know exactly why. Actually, the situation is, uh, yes, the situation is complicated. It's not the same. I should also mention that it's not the same for 3 sat and for 4 or larger equal to 4 sat. Larger equal to 4, there is another transition that is well known which is uh, where you, you can show that survey propagation does not go beyond that second transition. 3SAT, it might be possible. Numerically, you go very close. I mean, I, I, I have it working at 4.2, certainly. And the threshold, the analytical threshold is 4.267. And then you start to, uh, to enter into problems of uh, finite size effect. Because you see, all these works, actually, these are interesting algorithms, because the algorithms which work better the larger the problem. You know, when we first put uh, survey propagation on the web, uh, people th th downloaded it and was use were using it for systems of size uh, uh, 5,000. And then sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. And say, no, no, don't use it for 5,000. Put 50,000 or 500,000. It will work much better because the system itself is, I mean, the ideas behind that are ideas of phase transition, and, and you need to have more. <laughs> okay, let's 